I've made my list of best Deep Space Nine episodes, and I can live with it. Because I can live with it. Hello, interwebs. I hope you're all doing well, and welcome to my list of the top 10 best episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. For those of you who are new to the series, or possibly me, this is a series of videos that I'm doing where I'm trying to rank the top 10 episodes of every single Star Trek show individually. So I've already done original series, Next Generation, and I'm going to be doing Voyager, Enterprise, and modern Star Trek as well. But then, after doing one of those each and every week, it's all going to culminate in a single video where I'm going to try to rank the top 20 Star Trek episodes of all time, which I'm sure... No one will have any opinions on whatsoever, and my list will be the end-all be-all of that entire conversation. But, jokes aside, obviously this list is entirely subjective. These episodes on all of my lists are just my thoughts on them, the ones that resonate with me, the ones that I love, um, and the ones that I chose to put in there. And honestly, the ones that I just chose to put in there today, because quite honestly, if you catch me tomorrow, if you'd caught me yesterday, I might have put an entirely different top 10 episodes up here, because top 10 lists are entirely uh, a weird endeavor when you're talking about art, but uh, it's YouTube, so list it is. This was actually the hardest list of all the Star Trek shows to make because there are so many freaking banger Deep Space Nine episodes that it's honestly ridiculous to try and rank any of them because they're all freaking great. Like, don't get me wrong, I love every single Star Trek show and I have different favorites for different reasons and they all have their own pluses or minuses, but I think if we just sort of pulled back objectively, I think most people would just kind of settle on that Deep Space Nine is easily the best Star Trek show, like bar none. I think it has some of the most complex stories, some of the best characters, some of the most thoughtful explorations of a lot of its themes, and yeah, also had a lot of wonkiness to it like every single Star Trek show does, but overall, like, just, uh, I think Deep Space Nine is on the top of the pile of all the Star Trek shows and I absolutely adore it, which made picking a top 10 incredibly difficult and I'll be honest the honorable mentions that I'll be mentioning later on in this video any of them could have made the top 10 and like I said the, the chips fell where they fell this time but if you had asked me tomorrow I might struggle and come up with an entirely different top 10 list but this is where it's at now so we'll start at the bottom with number 10 in the cards in the cards, I think just really captures things that make me smile about Star Trek. Really, at the end of the day, this is just an episode about Jake working and trying to do his best to make his father have one happy day during the midst of all the crap going on during the Dominion War. And honestly, we kind of needed this episode considering where it fell within Deep Space Nine's storyline. I believe this is the penultimate episode of Season 5, right when the sort of Dominion War was right about to crank up to full gear going into Season 6. So this episode, just to stop and give us uh, time where it's just characters just trying to be kind to each other and try to care for each other and focusing in on the really strong relationship between Jake and his father, Benjamin Sisko, was just really great. But I think really the heart of this episode is just Nog and Jake just being in over their heads, all just trying to get a baseball card for Benjamin Sisko. It's just so much fun. And it highlights why the Jake-Nog relationship is honestly just one of the best persistent friendships throughout the entire series because we got to see these characters grow up together and you just, they're back and forth is just so joyous. And on top of that, this episode also kind of has like a lower Dexian feel to it, where we're getting to see the goings-on of Deep Space Nine from a new perspective than we normally do. Just fun to sort of see things from that lower perspective. Um, and it just makes for a really heartwarming episode that, at the end, just makes you smile. I believe you. You do? Yes. That is, I believe, your first story. That you're two innocent boys trying to give a gift to Captain Sisko. You're very wise. Number nine, Inter Arma Inum Season Legis. This is Latin. I don't know how to speak Latin. I probably mispronounced the hell out of it. This, I think, is the quintessential Section 31 episode. We often forget, given how, like, big Section 31 has become within the Star Trek lore, that Section 31 was a very late addition to Deep Space Nine and didn't get a ton of episodes to really shine other than when it was introduced and then the Dominion War stuff that it got to go on in later on. And so this episode, I think, is the one episode where we really get to see how Section 31 operates in its fullest and the sort of moral gray world that they work within. Because not only do we get, like, Bashir being drawn into this world and him trying to uphold his own values as a member of Starfleet in this sort of, like, belief in the betterment of humanity, we also see Admiral Ross fall into this as well, who up to this point was the one admiral who 
pretty much throughout all of Star Trek to this point was like the one good admiral that we got. And even he got drawn into making some pretty morally dubious decisions throughout this episode. On top of that, it's just a great espionage thriller featuring the Romulans and sort of looking at how Section the Word of One is like already thinking 10 steps ahead even past the Dominion War. And the twists and turns of this episode are also a lot of fun. And so um, a lot of people think Section 31 is very controversial. I particularly like it. I find it very uh, intriguing what they have to say and the criticism they bring to Star Trek as a whole. And this episode, I think for me, showcases why. Someone has to protect men like you from a universe that doesn't share your sense of right and wrong. Should I feel sorry for you? Should I be weeping over the burden you are forced to carry in order to protect the rest of us? It is an honor to know you, Doctor. Good night. Episode 8, Bar Association. Literally, I could have picked any Ferengi episode outside of Prophet and Lace, which sucks for numerous different reasons. But outside of Prophet and Lace, I could have picked any Ferengi episode and put it in the top 10 because Ferengi episodes, especially in Deep Space Nine, are so much fun. But for me, though, Bar Association, I think, is the one that stands out above the rest, not just because it's fun. And it is fun. Again, Ferengi's just fucking about doing Ferengi shit. But also, it has something salient to say. I will make no bones about the fact that I am very much a leftist. And so this episode, like, talking about unions and literally quoting Karl Marx and talking about workers' rights and things like that, and actually a big critique on not only Ferengi society, but capitalism in general, which the Ferengi were always sort of used for, I think speaks to me um, in terms of, like, the things that I think are very important for us to talk about. And I mean, this episode still speaks to what we're dealing with today. Like, things like unions and workers' rights are very much at the forefront of our conversation today. So this episode episode I think still is a very important one for a lot of the topics today and so it speaks to me politically and I just like that marrying of just the fun weird Ferengi times also marrying with what the Ferengi were always supposed to talk about like this capitalist critique as well as just actually being a salient story and then also on top of all that we get Brunt FCA played by the freaking great Jeffrey Coombs you can't go wrong with Jeffrey Coombs so just bar association absolutely fantastic shorter hours Page sickly. <laughs> this is no joke. Yes, it is. And the fact that you don't know that it is is what makes it so funny. Now get back to work before I fire the lot of you. You can't fire us. Why not? Because as of right now, we're all on strike. Yeah! <laughs> Number seven, take me out to the hollow suite. You know, I was honestly surprised by how many just lighthearted episodes made the list of Deep Space Nine episodes that I really, really love. Because when we think about Deep Space Nine, we don't really think of like the happy go lucky episodes. We only think it was like the darker Star Trek, like one of the more complex and darker themed, and it had the Dominion War and all this stuff. But honestly, I think Deep Space Nine had some of the best, lightest episodes as well, showcasing that it wasn't always just this dark and dreary show. And I think Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite is one of my personal favorites in that regard. Because it's just an episode where you get to see the crew of the station just trying to learn how to play baseball and just the fun that comes along with that. And also Cisco getting embroiled in this rivalry that he has with this Vulcan dude. And it's just, it's honestly just a good time to just see them all playing together. But at the end of the day, it also still has this heartwarming message at the center of it. Cisco ultimately learns that it's not about winning the battle sometimes. Sometimes it, when you're facing things like the Dominion War, where it is important to win the battle, sometimes you just need to take moments to just enjoy each other and take fun where you can. And him getting to allow Rom the moment to uh, just get to be on the team and swing and even lose the game for them, I think it just speaks to how wonderful this episode is in terms of just, it's all about forming a community and being together. And I love that Cisco realizes that in the end. And then also the episode ends on a bit of a Vulcan racism. And what's more Star Trek than Vulcan racism? Human game of taunting. Human? Did I forget to wear my spots today? All that intelligence and he still doesn't know what a human looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something else for your desk. Well, will you look at that? Would you like to sign it? <laughs> no. Number six, Homefront and Paradise Lost. 
Now we're getting into some of the harder hitters of Deep Space Nine, and Paradise Lost and Homefront, I think, are two of the most salient criticisms of Star Trek as a whole, and really set the tone for what Deep Space Nine was trying to do with its series after this point. You know, one of the things that everyone talks about when we talk about Star Trek, and particularly the next generation, was this utopian vision of the future, that in this future of the Federation, that we had created this perfect paradise. And Earth in many ways came to be a symbol of that like we had formed this like perfect eden on earth within star trek and so with deep space nine finally returning to earth i think one of the few times it actually does that over the course of its run it really wanted to highlight like what that means like are we really going to deconstruct this sort of utopian vision of the future and it showcases that sometimes when you believe too much in that idea of that we are better that we are have our strong moral conviction how that can easily fall if you don't really check yourself and really self critique yourself and this episode is all about that question of security versus freedom and people's fear and desire for safety sometimes overriding their good sense and i think one of the smartest things that this episode does is kind of play a little bit of a trick on the viewer because in the first episode a lot of these like push for like we need better security we need to protect everybody and these sort of like slow degradations of people's rights comes from Cisco himself and we as viewers are like yes we agree with Cisco he's making a lot of sense until you get to the final shot of that first episode where we see literal soldiers on the streets of earth and you're like oh this is what it all leads to and it was just such a smart criticism of all of that of like this dark path of security versus freedom and again that criticism of this utopian vision of the future and i really love in episode two that we get a moment where we just have the changelings literally sit down and laugh at cisco saying that there are only three of us on earth and we caused all this because this is what you are doing to yourselves out of your fear and so it these two episodes just incredibly showcase what deep space nine was trying to do when it was trying to deconstruct but ultimately uphold what Star Trek was always about. What if I were to tell you that there are only four on this entire planet? Huh? Uh, not counting Constable Odo, of course. Think of it. Just four of us. And look at the havoc we've wrought. How do I know you're telling me the truth? Oh, four is more than enough. <laughs> we're smarter than solids. We're better than you. And most importantly, we do not fear you the way you fear us. In the end, it's your fear that will destroy you. Are you finished? Finished? <laughs> We've barely begun. Number five, duet. I'll be honest, Duet is one of the hardest episodes of Deep Space Nine to watch because it was one of the early episodes of the show that showcased that Deep Space Nine was, number one, not your granddaddy Star Trek, but number two, was going to sit with these lingering issues much more than any Star Trek had before it. Unlike other Star Treks where you could zip away to another planet week to week, Deep Space Nine had to sit in some really horrific situations. And this episode spoke to the fact that the Cardassian occupation of Bajor was quite literally akin to the Holocaust. And we see the toll and pain and trauma that that takes out on everybody that is involved in it. We have our Cardassian in this episode who wants so badly be punished for the pain that his people has caused and the absolute horrific genocide that they caused to the Bajorans. And also Kira wrestling with her own empathy and trauma and pain and hatred and anger, righteous anger at times too, um, throughout all of this. And just, this episode is hard to watch, but ultimately this just showcased that Deep Space Nine was going to be something different. And it was going to be really delving into the complexities of stuff that Star Trek didn't always or wasn't always willing to do. And um, it's, it's truly phenomenal, if hard to watch. You didn't commit those crimes, and you couldn't stop them. You were only one man. Oh, no, don't you see? I have to be punished. We all have to be punished. Major, you have to go out and tell them I'm called Ail. It's the only way. Why are you doing this? Look at Cardassia. Cardassia will only survive if it stands in front of Bajor and admits the truth. My trial will force Cardassia to acknowledge its guilt. And we're guilty, all of us. My death is necessary. What you're asking for is another murder. Enough good people have already died. Number four. 
far beyond the stars. Speaking of issues that are hard to watch, this episode was another incredibly like directly look at the camera and say like this is what we are talking about episodes of Deep Space Nine. This time talking about racism. And this is a truly fantastic like look at how we devalue people's dreams and art and hopes for the future by dehumanizing them simply for who they are, for being a black man in this case. And I also really like that they did that story by having a sort of a reclaiming of, in a way, of Star Trek having been written, at least Deep Space Nine, having been written by a black man in Avery Brooks's character throughout this episode, Benny Russell. It's sort of showcasing that, like, these dreams for a better future are just as important regardless of where they came from, but that we dehumanize and devalue them because of where they come from. And it's also, this episode is a great acting showcase for everyone involved, but particularly Avery Brooks, and also a great directing showcase for him as well, because he directed this episode. And honestly, the moment where he breaks down at the end, just it, just sobbing and weeping, is honestly one of the hardest scenes to watch in all of Star Trek, and especially when you hear the story of uh, what it was like to be on set that day and how much it meant to Avery Brooks and how much he broke down filming that scene. Um, just a truly fantastic episode, and Far Beyond the Stars is just incredible feat of Deep Space Nine. At Space Station, all those people, they exist in here. In my mind, I created it. And every one of you know it. You read it. It's here. You, you, you hear what I'm telling you? You can pop a story, but you cannot destroy an idea. Don't you understand? That's ancient knowledge. You cannot destroy an idea. That culture, I created it, and it's real. Don't you understand? It is real. I created it, and it's real. It's real. Oh, God. Number three, The Visitor. This is an episode that every single time that I watch it, I end up sobbing. It is a truly, truly tragic episode about the relationship and importance of a relationship between father and son. Made even more important, by the way, by the fact that when Avery Brooks signed on to Deep Space Nine, one of the things that he stipulated that he wanted to be very certain that the show got right was the relationship between Cisco and his son Jake because especially at the time but even still today but especially at the time depictions of good black fatherhood were few and far between and so he wanted to make sure that this show really showcased a healthy relationship between father and son and I think the visitor really highlights just the importance of parenthood and fatherhood to someone like Jake even beyond the racial aspect of it this episode just highlights the tragedy of what it's like to lose a parent early and how Jake really could not move on beyond it and you really throughout the episode as the audience member you really want to just yell at Jake just kind of like Cisco is and say move on go on with your life you can be a full person even though you lost your dad like live your life to its fullest but ultimately Jake not being able to let that go because of how much his dad meant to him and how much it kept recurring to him because Cisco was still alive. Um, and at the end of the episode when Jake, spoilers, decides to kill himself in order to save his dad's life and maybe save both of their lives as well, I think you don't really agree with him, but you understand emotionally where he comes from. And it's just a truly hard-hitting episode that I, I weep every single time that I watch. For you and for the boy that I was. He needs you more than you know. Don't you see? We're going to get a second chance. Jake. Number two, past tense. Star Trek does not get any more political than past tense, and sadly, this two-parter is still incredibly prescient today. This is an episode where we go back in time and we get to see this storyline of people being dispossessed and shoved to the side by society, this homeless camps, these paradise districts, where people have just been left in squalor and being forgotten and ultimately having to react in violence to get their voices heard. And it constantly speaks to this idea that crops up a fair bit in Star Trek in that for humanity to get to our better selves, sometimes there's this crucible, this trauma, this pain that needs to go, we go through in order to realize that we need to stop dehumanizing other people and this episode speaks to that and yet it also still speaks to that hope with Cisco really upholding throughout all of this like, like yes this is the situation that we're in 
but we can try to work to make it better. We can try to make it constructive. We can push for this better future, even though there are dark days ahead of us, that we can make things better. That's what Star Trek is all about. And it, it really highlights in this episode what Deep Space Nine always tried to say, that sometimes humanity does not live up to our best potential but we can push for it even in our darkest moments. And it did so in a way that speaks directly to stuff that we are going through now. It is telling that even though this episode was made in the 90s, it's still ever present and feels like it was directly writing a story that we could say in the news today. Like if I picked up a newspaper today and saw that the Bell Riots had happened, I would not be shocked given where we're at in some of the ways we've dehumanized and dispossessed and shoved people off to the side. I mean, it's telling that while these episodes didn't directly talk about race, that so many people pointed to these episodes back when the George Floyd riots were happening a couple of years ago to point to like, yeah, these episodes got it when it comes to use of police force and dehumanization and criminalization of people just trying to live their lives and the way we do that uh, to different groups of people. So uh, a truly fantastic episode of Deep Space Nine and one of its most political. And what I always say when I say that Star Trek should always be political, this is what I mean when I talk about that. Look at this man. There's no need for him to live like that. With the right medication, he could lead a full and normal life. Maybe in our time. Not just in our time. There are any number of effective treatments for schizophrenia, even in this day and age. They could cure that man now, today, if they gave a damn. It's not that they don't give a damn. They've just given up. The social problems they face seem too enormous to deal with. Uh, that only makes things worse. Causing people to suffer because you hate them is terrible. But causing people to suffer because you have forgotten how to care. That's really hard to understand. All right, with that being said, before I get to my number one, here are a few honorable mentions of episodes that very easily could have made my top 10 list, but sadly for one reason or another, mostly my personal preference, they did not make it. And maybe for you, they would have made your top 10 and they very easily could have made mine. Our Man Bashir, a really fun Bashir Garrick episode and also a great James Bond throwback as well. Things Past. What You Leave Behind, The Siege of AR-5558, It's Only a Paper Moon, a great Nog showcase, by the way. Uh, he is so good in this episode, and I, I love the exploration of PTSD in this one. Waltz, a great Gul Dukat episode. Like, I didn't talk much about Gul Dukat on this list, but he is probably the best villain in all of Star Trek, and Waltz showcases the great psychology of this man and how he views himself, and I love the deconstruction of him in this episode. In Purgatory Shadow and By Inferno's Light, The Search. For the Uniform, Soldiers of the Empire, Sacrifice of Angels, Call to Arms, The Way of the Warrior, a great reintroduction to Worf and also a soft reboot for Deep Space Nine. Like, Way of the Warrior is great. The Die is Cast, The Sound of Her Voice, Trials and Tribulations. Trials and Tribulations is just a fun comedy episode and a great throwback to like nostalgia stuff. And I just love the way they intercut a bunch of different footage of the original series in there. Like really brilliant episode, Change of Heart. I love Change of Heart. While it did not make my top 10, it this episode is the quintessential Worf Jetsia episode for me. But that being said, let's get to my number one. And I am pretty sure most of you out there have already guessed what it's going to be because number one is In the Pale Moonlight. Of course, this had to be my number one episode of Deep Space Nine. I mean, a lot of people would even argue that it's the best episode of Star Trek, and I can certainly see why, and we'll see if that actually holds true when I get to my top 20 episodes of Star Trek. But for Deep Space Nine, clearly far and away the best. This episode is just a great, again, acting showcase by Avery Brooks. His Shakespearean like monologue that he gives to the camera is just a great dissection of like how Cisco fell further and further into this moral hole where he was making these choices to try to save the Federation because it had to be done. He had to bring the Romulans into the war or else the Federation would lose. But what that cost him and the slow slip into that. And while I have not talked about Garrick a lot in this list, though Garrick is, again, also one of the best characters in all of Star Trek, especially in Deep Space Nine, this is also a great showcase for him. Andrew Robinson's work throughout this episode, especially his final few moments with Cisco in this, where he just sort of yells at Cisco is like, this is the choice that you had to make. All it's going to cost is the self-respect of one Starfleet officer and one Romulan's life and a few other people's lives as well. And just, again, highlights everything that I love about Deep Space Nine in particular. This episode just wrestles with all the complexity that Deep Space Nine wanted to do and just is a true acting highlight, storytelling highlight, and just stylistic highlight for Deep Space Nine from top to bottom. And it is easily the best episode of the series. 
Well, it worked. And you'll get what you want, a war between the Romulans and the Dominion. And if your conscience is bothering you, you should soothe it with the knowledge that you may have just saved the entire Alpha Quadrant and all it cost was the life of one Romulan senator, one criminal, and the self-respect of one Starfleet officer. I don't know about you, but I'd call that a bargain. But that is my list for the best episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. But I'd love to hear all your thoughts down in the comments below. What you think of my list, or if you agreed with it, disagreed with it, or if you had other episodes that you particularly loved of Deep Space Nine. I'd love to hear all that down below. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for watching. Also, thank you so much for any well wishes that you may send my way. Because while I am recording this before my surgery, uh, this video will probably be released after I've had a recent surgery. So um, thank you to all of you if you sent me well wishes. And if you are going to send well wishes in the comments, I appreciate that as well. Um, but beyond all of that, I will see you next week for Star Trek Voyager. And beyond all of that, I hope that you, as always, my friends, live long and prosper.